Hey everybody, it's Steve from the Press and Steve Show, and yeah, it's my horror movie thingy. If you are a uh, listener to the Press and Steve Show, you know I am the horror guy on the show. I love horror movies all year round, and I love Halloween. Why? Because it's carte blanche to just go ape shit, as they say, and watch a ton of horror films. And so what happens, as you know, I often get called upon to recommend horror movies for people to check out every year. And in years past, I've done lists that are sort of best of lists, or here's here are the films you got to get out of the way. You have to really see these first before you see these, and blah, 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 blah. And this year, I'm taking a different tact. I'm doing more guilty pleasures. I'm doing um, horror movies that I enjoy, that maybe not everyone else enjoys, but I think they have something to offer because in many cases, there are kind of unsung heroes, little gems that people overlook because they perhaps haven't heard of them or have dismissed them. And I'm here to give uh, give them some exposure. Hopefully you check them out and enjoy them. Now, to do this, I wanted to do this right. So I wanted to have a co-host that would have the chops, the bona fides, I hope I'm saying that correctly, to impart a list that would be the equal of my own. And in fact, he surpasses me on all levels, Har, because he is the man who brought Monster Mania Con to the tri-state area and continues to do so, has been doing so for 20 years it is Dave from MonsterMania.net. Dave, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Steve. How are you? Doing very well. Thanks so much for being a part of this. Am I right? 20 years Monster Mania uh, yeah, has been a part we, of your life? 20 years. Yeah, we started this back in 2003. It'll be 20 years next year. And you've referred to it as a sort of a, a tribute to your father. Explain. Uh, boy, from as long as I can remember, every Sunday when I was a kid, my dad would take me to the old theaters in Philadelphia, the big 40 foot screens. And we would see like double features, the hammer horror, double features, Vincent uh -huh. Price, double features. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's one of the fondest childhood memories I have. And I lost my dad when I was 19 years old. So when my sons and I were kicking around the idea of doing monster mania, uh, we reached out to the different hotels in the Philadelphia tri-state area and the hotel in Cherry Hill came back with the dates that actually started on my father's birthday. So, wow. It just seemed like, yeah, it was meant to be. And well, you do a great job. We have actually the page up for Monster Mania Akan. I see you have one coming up. We're going to talk about that um, in, a, in a little bit because, uh, you know, honestly, I've been to a number of them and they're just effing fantastic from the events to the movies to the guests. Um, and this is where people of a like mind uh, can get together and just really savor this stuff. People who don't get it, they don't get it, but we get it. And that's all yeah. that matters. So I say, let's get started. Um, we're going to start uh, going through a list of horror movies that we want to recommend to you to check out. And first up on my list is a movie called The Possession. Now, The Possession is, uh, when people ask me, well, what is The Possession? I always describe it as mm, Jewish exorcist, basically. And uh, it is supposedly based on a true story. Let me read uh, the synopsis here. In the movie, Jeffrey Dean Morgan stars as a dad who begins to witness his young daughter acting strangely following the purchase of an antique wooden box with Hebrew markings on it at a yard sale. As days go by, she becomes more obsessed with the box. Her behavior becomes more erratic. And uh, it's based on the legend of the Dybbuk box. Now, there is a, an urban legend, a lot of people will swear it's true, that somebody actually did purchase one of these cursed Dybbuk boxes. And that goes back to... Uh, Jewish uh, uh, lore, Orthodox Jewish lore. Uh, um, I'm not exactly familiar on the specifics of it. They explain it in the movie. But uh, Manus Yahu, the musician, uh, plays a basically the uh, Jewish um, uh, a rabbi who uh, is called in to help with this family. And I got to say, I found this movie really pretty amazing in the imagery that they were able to conjure up. I know because... I am a seasoned horror film aficionado, and I found myself freaking out a couple of moments during this movie. It starts actually with this yard sale that you're seeing right here. What you don't see is before this, uh, the woman who owned this uh, Dybbuk box is trying to get it out of the house, and what happens to her is, is pretty chilling. And so from that moment, that was the hook. We were off and running. Again, it's a girl being possessed. I thought, oh, I've seen this before. But there are a number of um, uh, Dybbuk rabbits pulled out of that Dybbuk box that really surprised me. Dave, what did you think of it? Uh, I had not seen it until you had recommended it. Uh, really? And then when I watched it, yeah. And when I watched it, I was like really surprised by it all. 
Uh, I didn't know anything of the Jewish history of the Dybbuk box, but uh, after seeing the movie, I started looking into it, and I found that people are actually selling them on eBay. So uh, if you get a surprise delivery at your door, you'll you'll uh, don't open it. <laughs> where do you, where did you see they were being sold on eBay? Uh, if you if you do a search on Dybbuk boxes, you'll find them on eBay. Really? Because it's, it's my understanding. Jeez, that's because it, it's movie, probably you know it, prop stuff, but I wouldn't even want a prop. Why? No, forget yeah. it. I, for, I, I, no, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't screw around with that. All right, the second movie on my list, one of the absolute seminal movies of my young horror life, it is The Night Stalker, 1972. Um, and I agree with this article, which appears in Crime Reads on their website, a great website. Vampire Noir came into its own 50 years ago with The Night Stalker. This was a made-for-TV movie, Tuesday movie of the week. They used to do these movies, Tuesday night, Wednesday night movie of the week, and they would create these gems. And this movie has a great pedigree because it's directed by the great Dan Curtis, who is uh, the creator of Dark Shadows and a number of other great horror movies of the 70s, and the legendary screenwriter, screenplay writer, Richard Matheson. I am legend. Um... Uh, God, uh, the Trilogy of Terror, the countless Twilight Zone episodes. He's just a genius. And uh, and in this case, he took a, uh, a script that was kind of not too solid, punched it up, and made it something really special. Um, Dave, I assume you saw The Night Stalker when it first came out years ago as well, right? You were a little kid? Yeah, I was in eighth grade when it came out. I remember watching it on TV with my mom. <laughs> I had and to if, beg- if this wasn't on... If this wasn't on your list, it would have been on mine. Yeah, absolutely. I had to beg. I remember having to beg my mother uh, to <laughs> to uh, stay up and watch it. She said, "You can watch it, but you still have to go into school." And basically, the story is pretty simple. Let me give you the little uh, synopsis I have here. After several high-profile newspapers fire him for his difficult attitude, investigative journalist Carl Kolschak, played by the great Darren McGavin, finds a job following the police beat for a small Las Vegas newspaper. Carl observes a series of dead showgirl stories, and each one of them has a unique aspect to it. All of the showgirls have been drained of blood. Now, no one else is piecing what is obviously going on together, but Carl Kolschak does, and he starts to investigate. The movie works on so many different levels, and why they are correct in saying uh, Vampire Noir came into its own with this. What better town? for a vampire to live in than Las Vegas. A uh, 24-hour-a-day town, the nightlife never stops, and so pretty much this vampire uh, can go and come and go as he pleases. But where this movie really succeeds, uh, Dave, I think, is in the minutia of Kolshak on the beat, digging up the story, going to his, uh, his insiders down at the coroner's office, plying them with candy or whatever that he does, his little tricks to get information. And so he's always showing up at the scene of a crime right after, pol- after the police get there. And there's some really chilling crime scenes. And really what really sells so much of this is his voiceover narration. He's explaining what he's realizing. And when it all comes to fruition, again, Kolshak's the only guy who knows really what's going on, and Kolshak's the only guy who has the wherewithal to try to stop it, and that's why this movie succeeds so well. Um, and uh, and um, anything you want to say on the Night Stalker, Dave? I know you're a fan. Uh, I I completely agree. Darren McGavin was made for this role. Uh, this movie actually spawned the, a second film and then a television series. Uh, it, it's one of the finest made-for-TV movies ever made. It absolutely is uh, a true classic. And if you've never seen the original Night Stalker, treat it as a period piece uh, if, if the 70s throw you off. But it's well worth seeing. Uh, the next movie up on my list is one that I have uh, spoken highly of to the film's writer and creator and director. Um, it is Dead Silence. And this article here, and I forget the name of the Halloween Year Round is the name of the publication. I saw this title to this, uh, to this opinion piece, Dead Silence, 15 years later, the right movie at the wrong time. James Wan directing Lee Wanell, uh, the script, and then they, I think they both worked on the script. These are the guys who brought you Saw. This was one of the follow-ups to Saw. They were riding high. They had done really well uh, with Saw, and they were off and running. And obviously, you look at James Wan, you know The Conjuring, 
and uh, 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 Aquaman and, and uh, Conjuring 2 and uh, Insidious. Uh, the guy knows Har. Lee Whannell knows Har. He did that, in, that great um, Invisible Man uh, uh, and uh, Upgrade, Lee, uh, Lee Whannell. So they know how to write scripts. They know how to direct uh, movies. They know what they're doing. And I think they beat themselves up for Dead Silence. And I think they do it for no good reason because this movie, I think, is top notch. Um, let me explain to you what it's about. I wrote all this down because I ain't no dummy. I've been up since 3.30 and I want to make sure you know what I'm talking about. After his wife, Misa Grizzly, and Jamie Ashen, Ryan Quanton, who is from True Blood. You remember him from True Blood. He returns to his creepy hometown of Ravensfair to unravel the mystery of her murder. Once there, he discovers the legend of Mary Shaw. And Mary Shaw, as you'll see here in this picture, uh, Mary Shaw is the... Um, is the woman to the right, and there's the ventriloquist dummy to the left. Well, there's a story surrounding her death and uh, the fact that she swore revenge on the town and all the descendants of the people who lived in that town. And uh, the movie just really works for me. Dave, what do you think of Dead Silence? I, I agree with you. I really liked it. I do think he beats himself up too much about it. Uh, I think a lot of that was due to studio interference. I think he really got annoyed with the amount of interference that he was getting. Uh, I know initially this was supposed to be uh, the first of a series of films, but uh, they, I guess the poor box office prevented any more films being made. But I'd, like, I'd actually like to see him go back and revisit it. It was supposed to be, from what I understand, the beginning of, of, of a franchise like The Conjuring. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I really, listen, there's some outlandish stuff that happens in it, but as long as the movie plays within its own rules, as Dead Silence does, I'm on board. And there's some really brutal murders. The idea of dolls and ventriloquism and the creepiness of dolls and ventriloquist dummies works to great effect here. James Wan really knows how to build tension. And you know who's really good in it? Uh, Wahlberg. Um, not Mark. Uh, his older... His older... Don Mark, Donnie. Uh, Donnie. Why can't I remember Donnie? You know... Uh, uh, you know, Marcus uh, sucked all the oxygen out of the movie realm, but uh, Donnie yeah. Wahlberg turns in a really good performance as a, uh, a police investigator. And there are scenes in this that will just rock your world. Um, and a great yeah, reveal at the end as well. There is a scene at the end that finally, you're exactly right for bringing that up. There's a scene at the end that will, again, and we're going to get to another movie that James Wan directed later on in my uh, list that is... Uh, he really knows how to pull those final uh, scenes that will just make your head spin. Uh, next up on my list uh, is, let me just get it over here, is, flick it on over here, excuse me. It is The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Uh, Dave, had you seen this movie before um, I, I recommended it for the list? No, I, I watched it after you recommended it, and I was, it was something that I did not expect it to be. Uh, it, and it, I was really happily surprised with it. I did not see where it was going. It was not anything that I anticipated that it would be, and it was great. So it's a 2016 film, and it is. It is the pacing is very systematic on this. I'll give you the story. While investigating the murder of a family sheriff, Sheldon and his team are puzzled with the discovery of the body of a stranger buried in the basement that does not fit into the crime scene. He brings the corpse of the beautiful Jane Doe, a very attractive body, I have to say, late night to the coroner, who is Tommy Tilden, played by Brian Cox, who played the first Hannibal Lecter in Manhunter, and requests to have the cause of death until the next morning. Um, he, he wants to find out how, why this person died, who this person is. So Tommy gets to work on trying to autopsy the body with his son, played by Emil Hirsch. And what you start to realize is that something is really weird here. Something's going on with this body. And uh, you're, they're left to wonder is, everything seems to indicate this is a dead body, but there are things happening that indicate she might not be dead. And then, then things start to happen around the, uh, the medical offices there. And uh, you know how creepy those places can be to begin with. And there's all sorts of stuff that starts to suggest that there is a much more um, uh, nefarious force at work and perhaps even ties to a legend of a, of a witchcraft and uh, how this body, 
figures into that. I don't want to, I can't give away too much, Dave. Every time I try to go down a path to explain it, uh, yeah. I don't want to give away something that is so critical to making this movie work because it's the pacing that works so well for it. Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. The, and as they start finding things in the body and finding odd things, like it, you, you wonder where this is going. And then when you find out, it's, it's really well, it's really well done. Yeah, and honestly, I have to say, um, there's a lot of, um, I love movies that take place during sort of a, a contracted, you know, like Die Hard takes place in, you know, one 24 hour period. This has that feel to it. And there is a, a sense of desperation that they build in that will really get you. So again, not a lot of people know about it. The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Check it out if you get the chance. Next up on my list, I go to this one actually fairly often, and I've recommended it in some of my prior lists. It is Session 9. <clears throat> and as Ranker says, Session 9 is the best horror film you've never seen, and it's based on real-life events. Some of the events are correct in as much as uh, it is actually based on the demolition of a real asylum, the Danvers Asylum in Massachusetts. And as the story goes, they were, uh, the, the building had been condemned and they uh, apprised people, some filmmakers of this and the people who created and wrote and directed Session 9 said, well, here's this incredible edifice. We need to do something with it. And they basically wrote the script and created the story based around availability to this soon to be demolished Asylum. It is an incredibly uh, terrifying place, and uh, they use it to great effect in the movie. But the story itself is uh, they're clearing out asbestos, they're clearing out this, uh, this asylum for demolition, and different crews are bidding on it, and there's a, a down on um, his luck uh, guy who works in this industry, and he bids super low to get the deal, brings in some workers who are less than reliable, and what starts to happen is they start to encounter, as you would imagine, some very strange things. Session nine itself specifically refers to a collection of recordings in the basement that one of the guys discovers. And these are all sessions dealing with some of the patients that were in this asylum. And in this asylum is one of the first, I don't know if this is accurate, one of the first in asylums to employ prefrontal lobotomies which is a very gruesome way of, uh, very barbaric. They used to deal with this stuff years ago. And uh, he starts to listen, listen to session nine, which involves this woman who uh, one might believe was possessed by some sort of spirit. And that spirit might never have left this, uh, this hospital that they're working in. Dave, your take on session nine. I had not known about it until uh, sometime last year. And I know it, uh, what year did you say it came out in? Uh, session nine is 2001. Yeah. So I don't know how I didn't know about it for almost 20 years. Uh, but when I started looking for a list of films to see that, you know, to watch that I might not have seen, uh, this came up and I was really surprised by it. It, it was really well done. Uh, there's, you know, it deals with uh, the sessions with a girl with the multiple personalities that one might be more than that. Uh, and it just, it went in a direction that as you're watching it, you don't know what it's leading up to, but once it starts to reveal what it is, it's, it's really, really well done. Tell me something, and, and uh, this is what really I think works for me so well. There are multiple aspects of this movie that work, but just those scenes where the guy is sitting there listening to, listening to the recordings yeah. on the reel-to-reel -reel recorder that he found, that alone is chilling enough. Um, and then the poor guy who is the, uh, the guy who is the, the form in the job site, uh, I forget the actor's name. Uh, perhaps it's in here. So let me scroll through, um, to see what the, the deal is. Um, looking for his name. Uh, I can't find it, but, but anyway, the, um, the actor is excellent and he's, his life is falling apart and he needs this job and all this crap is going wrong and he can't quite uh, control it, but they can't, they don't want to give up the job, even though they think there's some other stuff that's going on that a lot of them would like to leave the job, but they need the money and they're, they're in this, this conundrum that just keeps, uh, keeps them there when a lot of times most people go, I'm getting the F out of here. Yeah. Uh, and then the ending again, a chilling ending that will live with you for a while. Um, it, it's, uh, it's one of those gems. I've recommended it a number of times. It's session nine. And finally, back to James Wan with Malignant. 
And as Variety says and pointed out at the time when the movie came out, which is 2021, not that long ago, why critics and fans alike are freaking out about the horror film's third act. Dave, have you ever seen a movie, a horror movie like Malignant? No, I haven't. <laughs> it reminded me a bit in the beginning of The Eyes of Laura Mars. where yeah, she's I remember that, Faye, Faye Dunaway, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where she's seeing things through the killer's eyes. But boy, it takes a turn, uh, you know, like you said, in the third act that uh, you just don't see coming. So let me give you the synopsis here. 27 long years after the uh, brutal Simeon Research Hospital incident that occurs right in the beginning of the film, abused Madison wakes up in a hospital in present-day Seattle, but with numbing visions of murder getting in the way of her normal life. And the way she is, um, the way this is depicted, and Dave, you'll, 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 I'm sure you'll concur, James Wan, the way he takes um, scenes in the movie where perhaps she's walking up the steps and the environment starts to turn and she's bearing witness to these murders and these gruesome attacks on people. And, um, you know, she's, she's wondering what in the hell is going on? Um, and, um, you know, she basically tries to become a detective to figure out, you know, what's happening to these people. In fact, there's one sequence in the movie where she's seeing the environment and she kind of knows where that building is. She, she's seeing through the eyes of what she believes to be the killer. And uh, she, you know, they, they beeline it across town to get over there. And, and obviously something horrible has happened. But let me tell you, in the third and final act of this movie, <clears throat> uh, specifically kicking off with a, uh, uh, in a jail cell, Dave, uh, again, I was by myself and I kept saying, what the fuck? <laughs> because yeah. it is a mind blower. And you can go one of two ways. You can say, this is absurd. They really lost me here. But I invite you to just spend the time and look at the audacity of what they did and go with it and you'll be well rewarded. Uh, again, for my money with James Wan and Lee Wanell, and again, The Conjuring and so many of the movies in Cities and the, the things that they've put their incredible talents to, you know when they do something like this, they're all in and it's well worth checking out. Uh, so that is Malignant. Your turn, Dave. Uh, your list of movies I found really excellent. Uh, and since I have the list in front of me, and you don't quite know where we're going to go from film to film. I'm going to lead you through your own list, which is quite presumptuous, but I'm going to do it that anyway. That sounds good to me. <laughs> First film up, and you made a great choice, The Legend of Hell House. Uh, one of my favorite films, probably the one film that if people ask me to recommend a horror film that they haven't seen, this is the one I go to. Uh, it's a great Richard Matheson 1973 film. Uh, it's about uh, a team of psychic investigators uh, go to visit this house to stay over this hell house uh, where a previous team of psychic investigators were killed and there were people killed in it before that. Uh, Roddy McDowell plays one of the psychics in it. Uh, Pam, uh, shoot. What, what is her name? Yeah, she said, uh, let's see if we can find it here. We uh, see I have it. Uh, Pamela Franklin. Pamela Franklin, who was actually in a number uh, of movies around that time. She was kind of a, a go-to uh, femme fatale. Uh, or, or yeah, victim, she I was, should say. She was, uh, she was in another horror film called The Innocence about 10 years before this. Great movie. Uh, which is another great horror film. Uh, but this is, you know, this is Richard Matheson at his best. Uh, it unfortunately get, c gets compared to uh, The Haunting, and uh, they say that it's kind of a ripoff of The Haunting, uh, which is a film that came out like 10 years before that, the Robert Wise film. But which it's is, really we not. It, 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 and you, 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 that parallel, I think, <clears throat> killed it for a lot of people, uh, and and they don't realize that this has every bit the merit to stand on its own. The haunting, the Robert Weiss one, is a classic. There's no choice about it. But this is every bit I think is engaging uh, as that, and and uh, I, I agree with you. And I, I would take exception with the Legend of Hell House is trashy. I don't think it. I don't think it's trashy at all. I think it has a really solid production value. Um, you know. The, are, do you find yourself, Dave, a, a big fan of the gothic haunted house uh, oh, story? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that. Like when it's a really stormy, rainy night, that's the kind of movie I want to watch. Uh, yeah. I completely disagree with the trashy description of it. I think it's very atmospheric. It's it's well shot. Even the opening shot with the black cat walking across the uh, the iron wrought fence as the the uh, investigators are coming up to the house. It, kind of remind you of uh, 
the exorcist when the exorcist is you know the famous movie poster when he's staring up at the house uh, yeah i think it's really well done it's really well written uh it has a you know when they reveal uh what the cause of everything is at the end uh it's done really well um you know, it's just, it, for me, it's a 10 out of 10 as far as haunted house movies go. I agree. I've recommended it uh, many times to people and a lot of people have never heard of it. I think a lot of people think when I recommend it, that I'm talking about, as you said before, the haunting and it's, it's not yeah. that it's well worth your time. Uh, the next movie up on your list is one that uh, a lot, I guarantee you a ton of people don't know. And yet it's this gem that's sort of sitting there, the last man on earth. And oddly enough, another Richard Matheson uh, uh, story. So have at it. Last man on earth, Dave. Well, I, I'll tell you this movie, when the pandemic hit and everyone was staying in the house and avoiding people and washing off your groceries, uh, that this movie came to mind immediately. Uh, it's an early Vincent Price film based on a, a Richard Matheson story. Uh, the Richard Matheson story has been told on film three different ways. Now, uh, was the last man on earth. It was Omega Man, and it was uh, I Am Legend with uh, Will Smith. Um, it, this is the best version of it by far. Uh, originally, it was going to be a Hammer film, but then Hammer sold it to someone else. It, it came out in 1964, but it predates Night of the Living Dead, but the two of them are kind of almost like companion films to me. Uh, they, they have a similar look. You know, the, the person's trapped in the house, the, the undead are coming to get them. Uh, it's just really well done. It's Vincent Price before he started chewing up the scenery like he did later in his career. Not that uh, we it, minded. It's one of my yeah, like Doctor <laughs> Fives and stuff like that. No, you're right. Yeah, but exactly. He's, he's playing. Theater he's playing. A, yeah, a regular, a regular guy. And I'll tell you something. You made a, a reference to it. Um, I believe it was George Romero himself who cites "I Am Legend" as yes. uh, the impetus for "Night of the Living Dead." Uh, the original source material, you're right, I believe, Last Man on Earth is the closest to the realization of um, of that story. It's still got about 50% that they left out that should have been there. And it's it really would be such a simple story to tell, but they've never done it. Oh, the Omega Man's way over the top. It becomes yeah. sort of funky uh, zombies. Uh, <clears throat> and then uh, I Am Legend, some some great elements they incorporate from the source material, but that's again way over the top. The original I Am Legend is such a simple story, and this actually gets that sort of guy in the suburb sort of feel, and his world collapses on him. And um, I think they, they do get a lot right. And as you're right, as a beginning to the the, the zombie um, craze started by George Romero, um, yeah. this is this is kind of the flashpoint, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one ironic thing about this is it was filmed in 1964, but he has a calendar in his in his house, and the calendar says 1968, and that's the <laughs> year George did Night of the Living Dead. So there's it's even tied in that way, even though it was unintentional. It's uh, yeah, it's it's definitely one uh, to check out, at least to to see where a lot of this stuff came from. Your next selection is a brand new movie, and it is Smile. Uh, Smile still in theater, so I definitely recommend if you haven't seen it to go see it. Uh, I saw it on a, on a Tuesday afternoon when I had nothing to do. I just went to the theater, figured I'd check it out, and about two thirds of the way through the film, uh, I texted a friend of mine and said, "This is really fantastic. It's much better than I ever expected it to be. Uh, it's a it's a curse movie similar to um, It Follows." Yeah, uh, similar to It Follows, similar to The Ring. Uh, it's about a girl who witnesses someone who smiles maniacally before they kill themselves. And then it starts a pattern of that thing happening on and on and on again. Uh, it's really well done. It's really well directed. Uh, it's the director's first film and, you know, much credit to there's great camera work. They whoever did the casting of the people, they must have made them smile for the casting because <laughs> man some of the scenes of the people smiling are just really creepy and well, what's and, really and, interesting uh, uh I, was just, I was just gonna say an interesting fact here uh dave and we had her on the show she was in uh the mayor of east town uh mayor of east town sosie bacon who is kevin bacon's daughter is yeah. uh the lead in this yes 
But one of the marketing ploys that they did for the film, which I thought like harkened back to the William Castle days, they would send some of the people that were actors and actresses in this film to major baseball games. Uh, they went to a Yankees game. Uh, I'm sorry, they went to a Mets game. They went to a Dodgers game and I think a San Diego game where they would pay the actor to stand up and smile like behind home plate. They'd be like three rows back and like it went viral. And it was just, it was such a great marketing Brilliant. campaign. Brilliant. And for people who yeah. don't know, William Castle was kind of the king of, um, of, of really being interactive and promoting films. And he would be the, the vomit bag at each chair had yeah. a vomit bag in the it. And they did <laughs> the tingler where they actually wired some of the seats to, uh, to give a little bit of a shock. Um, all of these Castle things. Castle Hill with the, were, with the skeleton uh, that would shoot down the theater. What was the Joe Dante film uh, that uh, where uh, John oh. Goodman played basically William Castle? Oh. Matinee? Uh, matinee, I think it was, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that that's a terrific uh, indicator of what that guy did. Again, he, he got it and had fun with it. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, you don't see stuff like that anymore, those kind of promotions no. that just sort of go viral. And it seems like... Uh, you know, for a while they were doing things, I forget what movie they did it with, uh, but they actually um, rigged up a uh, sort of a te telekinetic rig in a restaurant where someone got lifted up against the ground and it looked like the, the, the woman at the table that he was having dinner with was possessed and, and you saw these people freak out and it was brilliant and it got a whole bunch of traction. We need more of that stuff. And I love uh, movies like Smile. I think um, it follows, I still have to see it by the way, but it follows... Give me that because that kind of film forces you to say, how would I beat this thing? How would I, yeah. what would I do? How, how, how do you elude it? You know, and, and if it has you thinking that way, then you're, you've bought into it and um, everything else is going to have that much more impact on you. Uh, so a good choice on that. I definitely am looking forward to seeing it. I'm pre guessing because you like it. I'm going to like it. Uh, you're, <laughs> I, you're, I really like it. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Your next movie is one that I think has been overlooked a lot, but definitely deserves its place in this list. You're a fan of the 1978 movie, Magic. Oh yeah, this, uh, everyone, you know, when you think of Anthony Hopkins, uh, you think of uh, Silence of the Lambs. For me, I think of Magic. I think this is his his most uh, forceful, it's, it's like a tour de force of his acting chops. It's. He plays a uh, ventriloquist who you find out is on the verge of uh, national success. And uh, he starts to get basically afraid of the success. Uh, he he runs to evade uh, a mental test because one of the things that he has to do uh, when he goes on uh, like the Johnny Carson show and things like that, the Tonight Show, uh, for whatever reason, he has to get tested mentally. So he takes off to avoid that. And you basically see the deterioration of all his relationships and his dependency on this doll that he cannot stop. He cannot put it down. One of the one of the vital scenes in the movie, uh, Burgess Meredith plays his agent and Burgess Meredith realizes he's he's on the verge of having a breakdown. And he goes to visit him and he tells him that he's going to basically report him. And uh, he's he. Uh, Anthony Hopkins pleads with him not to do that. And Burgess Meredith says, okay, make uh, the doll's name is Fats. He goes, make Fats be silent for five minutes. And it's an excruciating five minutes. But I mean, this is Anthony Hopkins at his finest. Well, you, you raise a good point because while um, <clears throat> Lecter is a study in um, quiet, practiced, reserved rage, he has in this movie the absolute opposite. He's gone way off the deep end. You're wondering if um, if any of you what you're seeing is actually transpiring, or if it's just a, something in his mind. Uh, he actually did, as I recall, um, he was doing the the voice for the doll, was he not for the ventriloquism? Yeah, he was. Yeah. He was. Uh, he actually studied ventriloquism for this role, and that, that's his voice as the doll. And he actually, you know, does the uh does it's not overdubbed like his voice is not overdubbed while the doll's talking it's it's done in real time so he you know he really does a great job with it and the doll is uh, of course looks like him which mimics uh i think some of the more scarier uh ventriloquist dummy stories um have evolved like there, for example there was a couple of twilight zone episodes there was one with um oh yeah was it uh cliff um 
uh, uh, Robertson, uh, Cliff Robertson, where the, the dummy yeah. sort of looked a little bit like him, uh, you know, and, and in those, in those where the thing is basically robbing him of his own identity. Uh, and so that makes it, it creepy. But yeah, this is a movie that uh, the first time I saw it was not a big fan. And then I watched it um, a few years later, watched it actually fairly recently again, and it, it really rises to the challenge. And you have William Goldman, who is uh, of the time was one of the great screenwriters uh, and really knew how to pace a movie. So it may not be for everyone, but I agree, Dave, magic is a, uh, is a solid choice. Now, the uh, is this the final movie on your list? We have actually, um, yeah, this is the final. And I think it's a good choice, uh, a really good choice. And I'm glad you're bringing it up because if you are a fan of Dracula and you have not checked out this, then you're missing a lot. What am I talking about here, Dave? Uh, you're talking about Jack Palance as Dracula in a Dan Curtis production. Uh, it, I'm a big fan of Dracula films. My favorite film of all time is the Lugosi 31 Dracula. I love the Christopher Lee Dracula. I love the BBC Louis Jordan Dracula. Uh, Netflix came out with a Dracula series a couple years ago. It was a three-part series. The first two parts are excellent. The third part, not so much. But uh, I, for me, like this is of all those uh, variations of Dracula and interpretations of Dracula, this is the most ferocious version you're going to see. Jack Palance in this is just animalistic. This is the Dracula that you would not ever want to see. There's, it's not a, it's it's not like a love version of him. It's not like a romanticized version of him. This is just him over the top, angry, ferocious. It, it's a it's a great presentation of Dracula. It's the first one to ever uh, link the Vlad Tepish legend to uh, Dracula on film. It's the first one to bring up the reincarnation of his love on film, uh, much like uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula did later. A, the I, original I, I, title of this, the, the original title of this was Bram Stoker's Dracula, and Francis Ford Coppola bought the Bram Stoker part of that from. Uh, I guess the Dan Curtis production. Well, it, on this site, there's a, by the way, there's a number of great sites, and we'll have all the links to these uh, these sites uh, in the uh, on the uh, the page. Um, this is a uh, bloody disgusting, I believe. Is it? Yes, bloody disgusting. And they make a good point. And I would say this: pound for pound, this movie is more accurate to the source material for about fifty to sixty percent of the way through. And that's that's pretty amazing. You're right. I, I'm, you know, regardless of the romantic aspect of it, and the Francis Ford Coppola version, Bram Stoker's Dracula, I think is great. I would even call it a masterpiece in some levels because of the film um, making involved with it. They used a tremendous amount of practical effects, and it does, though, at certain points, become more <laughs> more like a Beauty and the Beast kind of thing. And yeah. it's uh, it has that that romance, which I get it. I understand that serves as uh, the impetus for Dracula, um, you know, to to uh, to move and and to uh, it motivates his actions in the original story to some degree, but you have to be you have to be scared shitless of of Dracula for it to work right. And Jack Palance, just by he didn't even need fangs; his face alone yeah. always looks tortured and taut and tight and scary. And uh, he's it was a sensational actor. And you're right. He delivers um, tremendously. I, I didn't know if you mentioned it, but did you mention Dan Curtis as the director? No, I, I might not have mentioned that, but yes, he is. Yeah. Again, Dan Curtis directing. And do we know who wrote the screenplay or uh, the, the version? Was it was it Richard Matheson? Uh, yes, it, I believe yeah. it was. Yes, this was a Richard Matheson script, too. So, so look at all the so work. Again, we're again to it's a... <laughs> <laughs> it's another team up of Dan Curtis and Richard Matheson. You know, it's just uh, and when when they talk about, you know, big directorial names in, in horror films like, you know, John Carpenter or Wes Craven, you know, I think Dan Curtis name deserves to be in there, too. Uh, you know, if you look at his body of work in, in just the horror field, not let alone, you know, the other things that he's done, you know, there's some tremendous stuff there. There absolutely is. And I agree a thousand percent. And and the truth of the matter on um his uh, legacy is that um, people who um, have been fans for so many years are now seeing that they get released on Blu-ray. I have the uh, the Night Stalker and the Night Strangler collection. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the um, the the House of the Dark Shadows, all the Dark Shadows, the original Barnabas Collins stuff, the original iteration, which is where he cut his teeth, um, you know, doing that sort of stuff. 
um, uh, you know, all of that stuff was um, uh, tr tremendous. Um, and and uh, you can find a lot of this stuff um, in existence out there in really um, lovingly preserved collections. So check it out. There's another great movie he did called The Norlis Tapes. Um, and I know you remember that one. That's another yeah. uh, really well done uh, movie. By the way, uh, Dave, did we skip Burnt Offerings? Uh, yeah, we did. We're for... For time, well, I think. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we, we can let me check the time here. We're at forty minutes. Do you want to? Uh, do you want to jump into it, or do we just suggest that people go see burnt offerings? Um, let's go we're for at 40, it. Forty. We'll just. Oh, you want to go you, for it? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay. Let me just call okay. it up right here. There's a lot of movies to juggle, so I apologize. Burnt offerings. Uh, no. There we go. All right, burnt offerings. This is Dave's final film, and a good one it is. Dave, uh, Dave, lead us through Burnt Offerings quickly. Okay, this is another great Dan Curtis film. Fantastic uh, cast. You got Oliver Reed. You've got uh, Karen Black. Uh, you've got Betty Davis. You've got Burgess Meredith. Uh, basically, uh, a family uh, takes over uh, renting this house, watching this house, while they have an older woman who's up in that window at the top. Uh, who needs to be cared for during the course of their their stay there. And uh, basically, you watch the slow deterioration and destruction of the family uh, and, and a whole supernatural backstory going on with involving the woman that's in the window. It's it's really well done. Uh, there's a recurring uh, dream that uh, <laughs> Oliver Reed keeps having about the uh, a hearse and the hearse driver that is really scary. Uh, there's a scene there with Betty Davis uh, that kind of reminds you of uh, a scene uh, in Pet Cemetery of uh, Zelda in the bed. Uh, it's really, really well done. It's, uh, it's, it's one of those movies that does not quite have a happy ending. In the 70s, you could get away with uh, not having to have an upbeat ending, and this certainly uh, lives up to that uh, you know, to that task. Well, I don't want to betray anything, but I will tell you this, and this might serve as enough inducement to check out Burnt Offerings because I happened to see it when they were doing a test screenings for audiences. And um, the uh, no one knew what it was about. No one knew, had any any clue. But at that, as that family, as you said, Dave, moves in to take care of this house and there's this, uh, this old woman who has to be cared for upstairs that only mom can go up and take care of. Karen Black goes up. Every time something happens in the house that causes someone to be injured, the house seems to look a little bit better. And, yeah, um, regenerates rates so, itself. Right, and so uh, I'll, we'll we'll leave it there. But burnt offerings is definitely an excellent choice, and uh, well worth checking out. Um, so, Dave, I want to make sure that we uh, deliver on our promise to talk about Monster Mania coming up. Um, let me just get uh, there. You go. Come on. Where are you? Give me two seconds. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh, they can't. Don't tell me we're not clicking through to Monster Mania. It was so beautiful. All right, let me switch back here and see if we can get it. There we go. Now we're back. Thank you, MonsterMania.com. There we go. Very excited about this roster you have coming up in November. Please tell us. Uh, well, it's November 11th to the 13th at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center. Uh, a lot of people that have come to see us at our hotels have always said, you know, they'd like to see us at an expo center. So here we are. Uh, it's a great venue for us. We're going to have uh, Robert England and the Nightmare on Elm Street 3 reunion with the Dream Warriors and Heather Langenkamp. Wow. Uh, we've got, yeah, we've got Slipknot's Corey Taylor. Uh, we've got uh, a film that is really making waves in the, in the movie theaters right now. And on every newscast you can see is Terrifier 2. Just saw uh, so Terrifier. Have... Just saw Terrifier one last night, and I am I am very much impressed. So if you think there's only room for a Pennywise in the deranged effing clown, um, <laughs> you know, line, no, uh, I think his name is Art the Clown. Art the um, Clown, yes. Yeah, and holy shit, uh, really yeah. well done, and a loving homage, at least uh, uh, one was to the uh, a, a real visceral, bloody. 80s early 90s style uh horror movie and uh i i definitely want to see terrifier too yeah and he's going to be there uh david howard thornton's the actor he's going to be there in costume for in costume photo ops so that should be oh, fun that's awesome um, 
I see a whole bunch uh, of things. And, you can see it here on the, on the page. Uh, and obviously, as you said before, it's actually the end of the camp out for Hunger Week. So I'll be able to wrap up and I'm going to head out on, on Saturday uh, to see it because, uh, you know, you've got so much great stuff going on. And by the way, thanks for including Max Fun, my wife's charity on your page. I just noticed that. Um, it's my great. pleasure, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's because of uh, your wife that I have the cat that I have now. <laughs> Um, you know, she's done I, that a lot. She's done that a lot for yeah, people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. It's changed my life. Dave, but, thanks so much for uh, joining uh, me today for this. And uh, I think we got a decent amount of time on this. I may cut a little bit out because we tend to go on. I know I do because we love it so much. Thank you for all that you've done to bring horror and the love of horror movies to the people of this area and the high quality stuff you put on with Monster uh, Monster Mania Con. Uh, always you continue to outdo yourself and uh, we just love it. So thanks a lot for joining us today. Uh, I, I appreciate it. And I, I appreciate all your support over the years too, man. You know, you guys have really, you know, plugged it on the radio and my family and I greatly appreciate it. I appreciate that. And I'm going to wish you and wish everybody a happy Halloween. Have a good one. Happy Halloween.